My name is Chang Seon Yong, and I'm an announcer and MC for this event. It is my great honor to be your MC. Thank you very much. And I hope you have an insightful and meaningful time together. Uh, this ambassador's roundtable session is a very special session. So we are now all together co co to cooperate uh, for sustainable peace and inclusive prosperity. This session will be held under the title of Diplomacy for Sustainable Peace and Inclusive Prosperity. I hope you have an insightful session. And before we begin this session, I would like to introduce our distinguished guests. So when I introduce our distinguished guests, please welcome them. Uh, first, uh, we have Her Excellency Ambassador Sri Priya Langanathan of India to Korea. Please welcome. Thank you very much. And His Excellency Ambassador Eric Teo, uh, Singapore to Korea. Please welcome. Thank you very much. And His Excellency Ambassador Philippe Lufok, uh, France to Korea. Please welcome him. Thank you very much. And next, we have Her Excellency Ambassador Catherine Laper, uh, Australia to Korea. Please like him. Thank you very much. And His Excellency, last but not least, Ambassador Koichi Aibosi, uh, Japan to Korea. Please like him. Thank you very much. And now, I would like to introduce our moderator, Mr. Do Kyu Do, Special Representative for Korean Peninsula Peace and Security Affairs of Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, to Korea. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him. What a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now let us begin this session and our moderator, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great, great pleasure to welcome you all to Ambassador's Roundtable and also to our beautiful island of Jeju. I'm No Gyu Duk, Special Representative for Korean Peninsula Affairs. I'm very privileged to chair this session joined by distinguished discussants. The main theme of this year's Jeju Forum is the uh, sustainable peace, inclusive prosperity. And the topic of today's round table is diplomacy for sustainable peace and inclusive prosperity. Peace and prosperity is the common goal, which is very important to all of us, yet not easy to achieve. I think it's quite opportune time to talk about this very interesting yet challenging topic as peace and prosperity are interlinked and mutually reinforce each other. In today's world, we are all faced with multiple global threats, ranging from COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, terrorism, and cybersecurity to nuclear proliferation issue. These threats are common challenges affecting every country, every person. One country alone cannot deal with these complex challenges. We need to cooperate and work together. So today, at a time when international cooperation is more than essential, we need good diplomacy as an indispensable means for engagement. Hence, we are here to discuss the role of diplomacy and how we as close partner and friends could collectively address these challenges and exploit opportunities. We are very fortunate to have distinguished ambassadors from India, Singapore, France, Australia, and Japan here with us at the Jeju Forum. Uh, even though the uh, MC very briefly uh, introduced today's discussant, uh, let me very briefly again introduce today's discussant. On my left, Ambassador of India, Sripuriya Ranganathan. Ambassador Langanathan is, uh, is a career diplomat who joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1994. Am I right? She most recently served as Joint Secretary of the Bangladesh and Myanmar Division in the Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, on uh, her left, Ambassador of Singapore, Eric Tell. 
Ambassador Tao was previously the Director General of the Northeast Asia Directorate of Foreign Affairs and was deeply involved in organizing the historic summit meeting between the US and the DPRK in June 2018. And next is the Ambassador of France, Philippe Report. He served previously as Director General for Information System in the Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs and was the Ambassador to Georgia and Special Representative of the European Union for the Caucasus. And next is uh, Ambassador of Australia, Catherine Raper. She served as First Assistant Secretary in the COVID-19 Coordination Unit from March to September 2020, and uh, previously was the first Assistant Secretary for Europe and Latin America Division in Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And the far left is Ambassador of Japan, Aiboshi Koichi. Ambassador Koichi is a career diplomat who joined the Foreign Ministry in 1987, probably most senior among us, am I right? He previously served as ambassador to ASEAN and Israel. He had already served in the embassy of Japan in Seoul twice and assumed ambassadorship to Korea this February. Now, I would like to invite each of our discussants for a short presentation. This round table is consist of, will be consist of two, two rounds, first rounds, all the discussants are supposed to give a short presentation under the topic of diplomacy for the sustainable peace and, and, and uh, inclusive prosperity. And then second round, I'm going to ask you to give another short presentation or short uh, statement regarding the topic, which whatever you want, you can speak, speak about, you, you can speak. So, now, uh, uh, let us begin with Ambassador, Ambassador Ranganathan of India. Thank you very much, Ambassador No. Uh, good evening to everybody. Good evening to my fellow ambassadors in this, uh, in this panel. It's a great pleasure to be here in Jeju. It's, uh, it's a very special place and I've always enjoyed coming here, but this is a very special feeling to be part of this round table. Friends, we meet in the shadow of a pandemic that has changed the course of our lives and has brought us face to face with unprecedented economic and social distress. At this juncture, the subject on which we are speaking today offers us scope for reflection on what each of us stands for in the international community. As our nations have evolved and progressed, so too has our diplomacy changed. It is natural for every nation to assess its evolving interests and accordingly frame its policies and work out its engagement. For democratic nations like ours, diplomacy is at its heart an effort at discovering common ground between like-minded countries, building on strengths and identifying complementarities that allow us to meet the aspirations of our people. A very relevant manifestation of such a vision is the decision that was taken by India and the Republic of Korea back in 2018 to build a future-oriented partnership for people, peace and prosperity. Another manifestation of this vision is the attention that we in India, and indeed I would say all of us on this panel today, have given to cooperation within the Indo-Pacific. The salience of the Indo-Pacific to our theme today is apparent. This vast region accounts for 60% of the world's population, carries 50% of the global trade, contributes 62% of global GDP. Cooperation between like-minded countries in the region that share a commitment to democracy, to rule of law, and to market-led economies is essential for building a secure and stable maritime space that enables prosperity for all. Any disruption to regional peace and stability imperils security, be it by hampering trade and commerce, disturbing the ecosystem, 
or creating disputes over rights. It is to meet these challenges that countries have fashioned Indo-Pacific approaches in their own way that are integral to their diplomacy. India's Indo-Pacific outlook envisages a free, open, inclusive region wherein all nations are united in their pursuit of progress and prosperity. Upholding the rules-based international order, underpinned by the rule of law, transparency, freedom of navigation in international waters, respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty, and peaceful resolution of disputes, while enabling pursuit of inclusive and sustainable development, is an article of faith for India. How can diplomacy help us to achieve these objectives? We seek ways to work on matters like maritime security, maritime pollution, disaster relief, exploration of maritime resources, and enabling connectivity and navigation. India has started to work on many of these areas with our partners in the ASEAN, Japan, Australia, the USA, and others through its Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, as well as the International Solar Alliance and the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. We look forward to working with our friends in the Republic of Korea on these matters as well. We also regard diplomacy as a means through which we share knowledge and resources to bring about not only lasting people-to-people -people connections, but sustainable development. India's Development Cooperation Program has sought to do just this and has always been premised on the preferences and needs of the partner country. Here again, we have been guided by some basic principles. Our projects, including on connectivity, are based on universally recognized international norms, good governance, rule of law, openness, transparency, and financial responsibility. We ensure through our programs that the partner country is not left with an unsustainable debt burden and that skill and resource transfer, technology transfer to the local communities takes place. We are also careful to pursue these projects in a manner that respects sovereignty and territorial integrity to the fullest. Such respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of other nations must be an integral part of diplomacy for sustainable peace and inclusive development. For its part, India has consistently based its relations with others, especially neighbors, on mutuality, mutual respect, mutual sensitivity, and mutual interest. We have, of course, faced situations where these mutuals have been cast aside. This ha happened in the course of the events along our border in eastern Ladakh last year. This happened when our sovereignty has been infringed upon through projects like the China-Pakistan Economic Cor Corridor. Other countries have faced such threats to their sovereignty as well. The challenge for diplomacy in such circumstances is profound and demands time and consistent effort by all parties. Such situations lead nations to find ways of working, formally and informally, with like-minded partners on the basis of shared interests and principles. In the COVID-scarred world that we live in today, this trend is apparent in discussions about how best to create reliable global supply chains so that the world does not face such an economic shock ever again. It's evident in the debates on how to ensure supply of essential vaccines and drugs to vulnerable populations, how to work on matters like climate change, counterterrorism, critical technologies, quality infrastructure, and so on. Our diplomacy here can and will make a difference. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Ambassador Eric Hill of Singapore. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to see everyone here again in uh, Jeju. First, let me thank the Jeju government and the Jeju Peace Institute for organizing this very timely ambassador's roundtable on diplomacy for sustainable peace and inclusive prosperity. Very, very important topic. Besides battling the COVID-19 pandemic over the last one and a half years, we have had to navigate an increasingly uncertain geopolitical environment. Singapore, as you know, is a very small city state. We are less than half the size of Jeju Island, if you can visualize how small we are. Some call us a little red dot. Therefore, political tension and disruption to the global system have an outsized impact on Singapore 
and the Southeast Asia region. It is in this context that I would like to share my views on the important topic of sustainable peace and inclusive prosperity. I will focus on three main points. <clears throat> First, the US-China relationship remains key to continue global peace and prosperity. Of course, there are other major and active global players but how the US and China, the top two economies of the world, work out their competition, their rivalry, and indeed their cooperation, will define the international environment for many years to come. While it is natural for the two major powers to compete for power and influence, competition should not inevitably lead to conflict. If both countries play a negative sum game, then the world will suffer. Clearly, Singapore does not see the US as a declining power. The US is a very resilient society and would always bounce back with its comparative advantage in so many fields, whether it is in the military field in high-tech as well as in biotech, just to name a few. The successful development of COVID-19 vaccines by the US in its current fight against COVID-19 is a very good example. China has also developed and transformed itself. It wanted to protect and advance its interests abroad and secure what it sees as its rightful place in international affairs. But China must accept that the world has higher expectations of it today. A more powerful China has to respect global rules and norms and take greater responsibilities for upholding the international order. Like everyone else, Singapore is anxious about how the US-China relationship will play out. But it is clear that almost every country in the Southeast Asia region, and even beyond, do not want to choose sides. To us, what is key is to build trust and not walls. Build bridges and not widen the gaps between the two powers. Negotiation is always about give and take. It is our sincere hope that the two major powers can have wisdom to find a way forward to maintain peace and work towards inclusive prosperity in the world. My second point is about the rising tension in cross-strait relations, which really is a function of the current state of US-China rivalry. In my previous role as Director General for Northeast Asia, my team and I had the privilege of organizing the historic meeting between Mr. Xi Jinping and Mr. Ma ying in November 2015. They were called Mr. because of the sensitivities involving cross-strait nomenclatures. The so-called CIMA meeting in Singapore was a milestone in the history of cross-strait relations, which was the first meeting between the leaders across the Taiwan Strait since 1949. Singapore agreed to host the CIMA meeting as it provided both sides the platform to engage each other in constructive dialogue, which is better than no engagements at all. Fast forward to 2021 today, and we see that cross-strait relations are at an impasse and the trajectory is worrisome. While there are clearly differences in perspectives and the lack of trust, we do not believe that military conflict is inevitable. No one wants war, as the biggest loser will be the people across the Taiwan Strait. We hope that cooler and wiser heads will prevail to preserve continued peace and prosperity. My third and last point is about the fluid situation in the Korean Peninsula. Other than the CIMA meeting in November 2015, I also had the privilege of being closely involved in organizing the historic summit between US President Trump, then US President Trump, and DPRK Chairman Kim Jong-un in June 2018, which was also the first meeting between the leaders of US and DPRK. It was significant that a joint statement was issued after the summit, 
which laid out the framework to take US-DPRK relations forward. Notably, the recent conclusion of the Biden administration's DPRK policy review has taken into consideration this joint statement signed in Singapore, which can provide the basis for the resumption of US-DPRK dialogue. To achieve progress on the Korean Peninsula, all parties should fulfill their commitments and refrain from actions that escalate tensions. We are glad that the US has chosen diplomacy and dialogue and hope that the DPRK will respond soon. Major breakthroughs need time, patience and political will. In the meantime, we must continue to engage. Let me sum up. From the perspective of a little red dot, I have highlighted the three key areas where things might go wrong if wisdom does not prevail. This is not to forget that there are other major challenges the world is facing, such as the COVID-19, such as climate change, which have made it even more important for governments to double down on diplomacy and international cooperation. While it is true that foreign policy begins at home, and at times, diplomacy and dialogue may be painful, and it is not always easy to convince our own people. The alternative of conflict and war has far worse consequences. Cooperation does not solve all problems overnight, but we must at least give peace a chance. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Teo. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts related to uh, US-China relations, Taiwan Strait, and Korean Peninsula with us. Thank you. Uh, next speaker will be Ambassador Lefort from, from France. Floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Yeah, it's my ability. Sticking of the uh, clock of uh, uh, environmental dis disasters to the uh, competing hegemonies of the uh, United States and China, and to the lot those numbers of uh, of conflicts of higher or lower intensity uh, uh, on the planet, uh, certain of them turning into uh, terrorism. Uh, we deal also with uh, new actors, uh, some uh, uh, well uh, powers uh, uh, who are uh, challenging uh, the world order, and also with an atmosphere of unrest in our populations uh, at home, mistrust uh, to political or international institutions. So. Uh, this is a cha quite challenging situation uh, on which uh, when President Macron uh, defined last uh, 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 fall uh, four principal pillars and objectives for the uh, uh, French uh, foreign policy. The first one uh, is to recreate sovereignty and strategic autonomy. Uh, last year, our president said that uh, uh, the crisis has revealed that there are good dependencies and there are dependencies that weaken us. International trade, of course, brings a lot of prosperity uh, in such a way uh, but it is uh, fair and open. But also we have seen how much we were vulnerable to global crisis by our overly dependency from uh, foreign countries, including China, on such uh, key uh, uh, needs uh, as of energy. Uh, food, uh, medical and pharmaceutical product, and I would add also uh, technologies of information. Of course, uh, the solution also, that's the second uh, uh, point, uh, is also going through uh, multilateralism and restoration of multilateralism. Unlike previous crises, I would also point uh, uh, the fact that uh, superpower might not be uh, longer the driving force. And we believe that there is a strong opportunity for non-hegemonic powers uh, that respect rule-based order and value international cooperation to step in promote and rebuild multilateralism. And that's what we have, uh, uh, some of the initiative that we have taken with Germany. Uh, we have launched the Alliance for Multilateralism in 2019. And we believe that it, it's a good solution to uh, uh, give momentum uh, to the uh, uh, rebuilt uh, multilateralism, of course, uh, within the, the respect of the Charter of the United Nations. Which is, uh, or which, we say, which is absolutely key for, uh, for us, as for everybody. 
My third point uh, is also about uh, uh, the European uh, Europe and the European Union. I'm speaking from a French perspective, of course. We believe that Europe is not out of the game and uh, that uh, we have emerged from COVID-19 with a new sense of solidarity and a stronger desire to develop our technological and industrial sovereignty. For instance, uh, Europe has recently made important geopolitical shifts vis-a-vis -vis China that we describe as a partner, a competitor, and a systemic rival for the, uh, uh, for the EU, uh, for the uh, European Union. And we have decided also to develop on an Indo-Pacific strategy. I won't go into the details, but uh, let me just say that the, uh, the geopolitical awakening in Europe will be the one of the French EU presidency priorities in 2022. We have, the, again, the presidency of the European Union. And let me finish with uh, uh, the fourth point, uh, which is concerning uh, the need to protect our freedoms and our democracies uh, in the digital era, and more particularly uh, with uh, this new wave of technological changes coming with uh, artificial intelligence and, uh, well, the application of quantum physics uh, to computing and uh, other uh, technical processes. Uh, we know that it's a world of opportunity, but also a, a world of, uh, of, of new risks, from the manipulation of information and emotions, which leads to violence, uh, to the use by authoritarian states of those new technologies to control and censor its population, to the position of digital giants. Uh, uh, everybody remembers uh, how uh, an important head of states has been deprived to his access uh, to uh, 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 SNS at the beginning of the year on the only decision of, uh, of, those, uh, of those companies. So we believe that uh, there is need to uh, uh, cooperation and international regulation in the cyberspace and new, new norms should be built uh, to protect our population. And that's, of course, not uh, enough because it requires also uh, the cooperation uh, of everybody from civil society, private companies, consumers, etc. France has taken the initiative to uh, uh, create an international partnership for, on information and democracy, endorsed by 42 countries, including the Republic of Korea. And we believe that uh, all those uh, actors can make uh, decisive steps to uh, contribute to the respect of freedom of expression and information and the reliability of information as a key part of democracy. And speaking about freedom of speech, I think I've spoken too much. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you, Ambassador Report. Uh, before uh, moving on to the next speaker, I'd like to uh, briefly talk about the uh, impact of the pandemic. I can assume we all agree that the COVID-19 has undoubtedly changed the entire humanity's way of, way of life and the way of thinking, not to just a single country, as the virus knows no national boundaries. The pandemic has also disrupted and distorted diplomacy in many ways. The world is now adapting to this new kind of normal. Perhaps we'll be able to hear more from the two ambassadors who have arrived in Korea after the breakout of the pandemic. Now, I give the floor to Ambassador Catherine Raper from Australia. Microphone. Yes. Um, now I'm working. It's a pleasure to join you here today at the 2021 Jeju Forum. Uh, 2021 is a, a key year for Australia Republic of Korea relations. It's our 60th anniversary of diplomatic relations. And as such, it's a good time to focus on how we are ensuring that we can maximize the potential of our relationship. So in line with today's theme, I'd like to quickly outline Australia's priorities in our region, the Indo-Pacific region, and offer some views on how like-minded nations like Australia, Korea, and the other countries represented in this round table can work together to address the challenges and opportunities we face. As already highlighted, the Indo-Pacific is witnessing a major shift of economic and political dynamics. The most significant recent change has been to the relationship between the US and China. In remarks before the recent G7 Plus Summit, 
the Australian Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, identified this escalating great power strategic competition as the defining issue of our time. There is no question that the relationship between the US and China is strained, trade tensions continue to escalate, and there's unquestionably political tension as well. As Korea knows well, the impact of this dispute will not be limited to the US and China. This has profound implications for regional stability and in turn, security, prosperity and quality of life in all of our countries. Australia has a long-standing alliance with the United States, the roots of which are deep and continue to grow. We actively seek ways to work with China, itself a major Indo-Pacific power and a vitally important partner for Australia. There will be times when Australia and China disagree, but points of difference shouldn't prevent us from proceeding in areas of cooperation and from dialogue. Australia's vision for the Indo-Pacific, and one I believe that is shared by other countries represented on the panel today, is of an open, inclusive and resilient region, underpinned by rules, norms and respect for sovereignty. Australia's national interests, including our economic recovery from COVID-19, are tied to the stability and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific. We are a vocal champion of and advocate for respecting international law, free societies and open economies, underpinned by strong independent institutions. And we want to see this as a basis on which the Indo-Pacific continues to operate. Australia is also an open export oriented market economy, trading our goods and services around the world. We believe we must be doing more to ward off the threats of protectionism to ensure that trade can continue to drive regional and global growth. For this reason, Australia has been a strong supporter of the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, or CPTPP, and the important role it plays in regional economic integration. And I'm pleased that Korea is currently considering whether it will join us as a member of the CPTPP. As we face an increasingly uncertain, competitive and contested world, Korea will need to be increasingly engaged and agile on how it pursues its interests. Korea now has the capacity to change and shape the regional environment in ways it hasn't previously. Increasingly, Korea has the political, economic and cultural power to forge new partnerships and build institutions that support its interests and amplify its messages. The challenges we face are too varied, big and complex for any one country to reliably address alone. Meeting these challenges will require an active cooperation among like-minded countries and liberal democracies not seen for 30 years. Countries like Korea and Australia are not big or strong enough economically or militarily to impose our policy preferences on anyone else. But we are both countries of consequence, able to bring new ideas to the table and to meet the challenges we face. And I'm pleased to be working with Korean counterparts across our shared interests in the Indo-Pacific region, including active cooperation under Korea's New Southern Policy Plus and Australia's priorities in the Indo-Pacific. Australia is also working closely with the other countries represented on this round table today to ensure the open, inclusive and resilient Indo-Pacific region I said out earlier. We have strong cooperation with India and Japan in the Quad alongside the United States. We are engaging ASEAN and its member countries, including Singapore, as steadfast partners, and we have welcomed France's increasing engagement in the Indo-Pacific region. We believe such cooperation and coordinated action between like-minded partners is the key to navigating successfully the geostrategic challenges of our region. Thank you. I'm Sanita. Thank you. Uh, now our last speaker. I would like to invite Ambassador Aibo Shikoichi from Japan. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for the hospitality and the generosity and also really broad theme of this event. Um, um, I realized that uh, uh, at the arrival, uh, japan ROK relations uh, related event is going on just next to uh, this room. And uh, I don't know, the organizers uh, intentionally or unintentionally put me in this event. Uh, maybe I feel at ease uh, not to speak about japan ROK relations in the next room. So anyhow, <laughs> uh, I uh, uh, haven't 
really prepared any paper today. I thought that uh, 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 with this scene, I'm not really uh, uh, supposed to talk about the pan orchid relations. Maybe you might be interested in, but uh, uh, I'll do otherwise. And then uh, I don't say it's a once in a lifetime occasion, but uh, uh, it's a really uh, <laughs> rare occasion for me uh, since my arrival. And uh, 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 anyhow, I would be brief. Uh, so, and I also uh, thought about as uh, we have so many like-minded countries uh, in this long table meeting. So somebody will exhaust the Indo-Pacific uh, FOIP, uh, maybe my previous speaker, <laughs> so that uh, no need to mention about this uh, uh, FOIP. Although, uh, briefly, FOIP uh, was launched uh, maybe uh, 2016 uh, on the occasion of the African Development Conference in Kenya. Uh, Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Abe really uh, touched upon uh, this uh, well, to enhance the connectivity between Asia and Africa. Well, I'll sk skip all the other elements, but uh, today I, I'm thinking of what to, to uh, talk about. Uh, so this uh, sustainable peace and uh, inclusive, uh, uh, sustainable peace and inclusive prosperity and uh, since I came uh, to Seoul, I recognized quite a few events about ESG. Uh, ESG is uh, environment and uh, social or society and governance, uh, mainly sort of uh, uh, driven by the uh, bankers or uh, financial security firms, uh, all these people. Uh, I attended the ESG forum, uh, and the uh, deputy prime minister attended, but uh, the, the most of the, uh, the participants are either uh, the financial people. And uh, uh, I think uh, we should uh, uh, dollar or pay more attention to the SDGs, as uh, SDGs is... Uh, something adopted under uh, the uh, Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. Uh, it was 2015. And uh, uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon always uh, put his pin badge. Uh, and uh, I, I also, today I carried the pin badge. Uh, and then uh, I haven't really uh, noticed the, the, uh, this pin badge uh, in Seoul or even in this uh, conference sort of uh, facilities. The, so maybe SDGs and the ESG is a bit similar, overlapping. Uh, but I have to say SDGs are uh, much broader and uh, uh, the wide variety of stakeholders are engaged. Uh, ESGs are well, more, more or less uh, private sector, but SDGs is uh, uh, maybe the local governments or uh, civil society and uh, academia, uh, international organizations, or maybe individuals. And uh, empowerment of uh, individuals, uh, especially women or the uh, socially dis uh, vulnerable people are really important. So in that sense, uh, well, the, I know that the uh, P4G summit was uh, held in, uh, this year uh, in Seoul and it, it was a really successful event, but uh, uh, maybe we need to uh, uh, raise the public awareness of SDGs in, uh, in uh, Korea uh, a bit more, uh, because, uh, uh, and also in Jeju Island. Uh, this uh, Jeju Forum is a good platform to launch this SDGs issue. Maybe uh, next year we can uh, eliminate all these pr ocean plastics or maybe this is a recyclable one uh, and without any etiquette. So it's a, 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 in a sense, environmentally conscious one. But uh, anyhow, so that is something uh, we can launch. Uh, so, uh, and uh, in case of Japan, I, I, I'll uh, stop in uh, two or three minutes. Um, uh, it was 2016. I was in charge of uh, this SDGs issue. So I, I, we, are, uh, we don't know how to, to address this SDGs in Japan. 
because、uh, you know, SDGs is、uh, 17 goals and、uh, 169 targets,、uh, too many.、Uh, once it was criticized as a Christmas tree.、Uh, so maybe、uh, we have to, to, to transform this SDGs to the、uh, more sort of accessible,、uh, understandable sort of uh, uh, action plans. Or uh, uh, I don't know, the,、uh, in case of Japan, the、uh, Uh, we、uh, elaborate two things. One is、uh, guiding principles. So we just、uh, simplify the, the major principles of these DGs and the、uh, uh, priority areas. And also,、uh, maybe it's too ambiguous to l e a v e as such. So on the other hand, we elaborated the detailed action plans. And then、uh, all these action plans,、uh, we need a really strong、uh, leadership、uh, to implement. So、uh, we set up、uh, the what we call SDGs、uh, promotion headquarters. Uh, uh, the uh, head is、uh, then prime minister. So with these efforts, now the,、uh, maybe too many events in Japan,、uh, always a, a Japanese journals or TVs, all these、uh, sort of、uh, medias are now, they try to, to always put the SDGs logos. Maybe、um, SDGs, put the SDGs logo is not enough. We have to more substantiate、uh, what we are supposed to do. But uh, anyhow, uh, I hope the,、uh, we can see a more pin badges or SDGs logos in、uh, Korea.、Yeah. This is the end of my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Iboshi.、Um, we just、uh, finished the、uh, five ambassadors' presentation, show presentation, and it seems that、uh, there are some、uh, key words like、uh, free, open, inclusive, resilient, rule based order, multilateralism. SDG, competition, conflict, friendship, and peace and prosperity. So these are the keywords we have discussed in the first round. For the remaining time, I hope、uh, we can have discussions about more specific issues, whether they are international, regional, or bilateral. As a matter of fact, today marks the 21st,、uh, 71st. Anniversary of the outbreak of Korean War. As there was a truce and not a peace treaty in 1953, the two Koreas still remain technically at war. Against this backdrop, Moon Jae in government has so far made continued efforts to realize peace and prosperity on the Korean Peninsula, as well as in Northeast Asia, together with the partners in the region. And the international community. However, I do not want to confine、uh, the next discussion to the Korean Peninsula context only. Overall, we are at an important juncture, a time of many challenges, but also of opportunities that we can seize in 2021 and afterwards. In your view, what are the key pressing global? Regional or bilateral issues that we need to deal with. Are you ready? Okay. Then、uh, I will give the floor to the Ambassador Langanathan. Yes. Okay. Thank you again, Ambassador No. Uh, since I have the freedom of choice, I will uh, choose uh, somewhat differently from the Japanese ambassador and I will、uh, choose to reflect on, uh, on uh, uh, the manner in which the India ROK partnership can actually contribute to the second portion of, this,、uh, of the theme that we have today, which is inclusive prosperity. I think this is an area in which uh, we, have been, uh, uh, we have been proceeding very systematically, and I think it has、uh, yielded a lot of results already. We have seen that the,、uh, that the vision of our leaders that we should 
be able to leverage the very cordial and very um, uh, uh, trouble-free relationship that we enjoy, uh, which has in fact uh, uh, lasted across the centuries. It is not even across the decades, but across the centuries. You alluded to the Korean War and uh, during the Korean War as well, uh, uh, India was part of the sending states. We did not come in as a fighting, uh, uh, fighting uh, force, but we did come in to provide humanitarian assistance to the uh, UN command, and that was uh, that was a role which uh, which we played, which is uh, I think less known than it ought to be. Certainly in India, I have found that the uh, awareness of this uh, role that was played by the Indian armed forces. Uh, back in 1950 to 1953 is sadly lacking. And in fact, I myself, uh, even though I have been a student of history, uh, was not completely aware of all the intricacies of how we were involved at that time. But that is a story for another day. Um, in more recent times, we have managed to build a very strong uh, and I would say complementary economic partnership. Uh, we have a comprehensive economic partnership agreement which has stood us in good stead. We've been, uh, we've managed to really build up our uh, our uh, uh, awareness of each other. Uh, but again, and uh, this is where I I feel as the Indian ambassador to ROK that so much more can be done. There is so much of synergy between uh, Indian strengths and Korean strengths, Indian needs and Korean needs. Uh, we have a huge demographic dividend, we have a huge population, we have a, a population which is youthful, which is growing. I think in, uh, in, uh, in a kind of an exact match to that is the, is the uh, position that uh, the Republic of Korea finds itself in, in which, the, in which the, you are worried about, your, uh, about the trend of your, uh, of your population. There is a need for more uh, 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 connections with, uh, with people who can provide the services uh, across the world. Uh, we offer a very, very low cost, very competitive, very, uh, uh, very capable uh, economic uh, uh, manufacturing and services environment. Uh, and I think that again is a good match for the concerns that I've seen repeatedly expressed in, uh, in uh, Korea Incorporated that the costs of manufacture in India, in Korea, have been growing so much that the competitiveness is at risk. And I think the, 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 the thrust of what we have been trying to do uh, at the embassy over the past few months uh, has really been to, uh, uh, to build awareness of the Make in India for the World concept, which I think some Korean companies have uh, availed of and, uh, and have shown the way. And I think uh, so many more Korean companies can do similarly. And likewise, I would like to just end with one last uh, point, and that is that um, uh, when we are looking at the at the situation that we are faced with right now, when uh, COVID is really uh, top of the mind for anybody uh, in whatever uh, situation, in whatever organization they may belong to, uh, and I think there's so much of scope for uh, Indian strengths and Korean strengths to be leveraged in this as well. Uh, the kind of innovation and the kind of uh, uh, ecosystem that is being created in, in Korea for, uh, for pharmaceuticals, for vaccines, for, uh, uh, for uh, the critical technologies, uh, I think the, the focus on the fourth industrial revolution, these are all areas on startups, on, uh, on uh, green economy. These are all exactly the areas in which we in India are also focused and where we also have strengths. And I think as partners and as uh, like-minded countries, we refer to that repeatedly in the, in the course, and all of us refer to that. I think this is the time for us to find the way to leverage these connections and uh, really make it possible for the world to benefit from this bridge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for sharing your idea upon the uh, bilateral relations between uh, Korea and India. You touched upon many areas for cooperation. That means you have a lot of work to do oh, yes. in Korea. <laughs> okay. Now, next speaker will be Bastel. Yeah. Thank you, okay. thank you very much. Uh, for this uh, second discussion topic, I would like to focus on two main topics which I didn't have time to cover. 
First is actually the more immediate one and will be with us for some time, which is COVID-19. Okay. Second topic is uh, not new, is with us, will be with us for many years to come, and that is climate change. Okay. So first topic, COVID-19. COVID-19 has affected our lives and livelihoods, taken away the jobs of our people uh, because of the poor uh, uh, economy performing uh, poorly because of the uh, uh, pandemic. It has also shown that actually the pandemic, the disease does not respect any borders. It travels. Uh, and no one is safe until everyone is safe. So we are clearly mindful about that. But the pandemic has forced countries to close up, close up in a, a based on public health concerns. Uh, that has in turn uh, shown us that how interconnected our supply chains and economies are. So on the one hand, you close up. On the other hand, you see that once you close up, there are consequences uh, to the rest of the world. So therefore, I would reiterate that it is very important for governments to double down on diplomacy and international cooperation, no matter how difficult it is uh, when we confront the challenges of COVID-19 and work towards a more sustainable and inclusive uh, future. Singapore, as you know, continues to advocate uh, vaccine multilateralism as against vaccine nationalism. We founded and also co-chair the COVAX facility with uh, Switzerland. So we continue to advocate for that. The second topic is on climate change, the challenges posed by climate change. And I want to talk about this at the, at the various levels. At the international level, we have the Paris Agreement, which established a very important global consensus for action and uh, action on climate change. Regionally, groups like ASEAN works very closely with the international community, including ASEAN stand dialogue partners to address ongoing environmental uh, issues and concerns. At the bilateral level, countries are already cooperating closely on mutual areas of interest, including uh, exchanging know-how. Then at the macro level, uh, perhaps multilateral systems like the UN and the World Trade Organization, among others, can continue to adapt and reform. I think they have to catch up with the times. It is important for these platforms to be more uh, representative, to be more open, and to be more inclusive uh, in order to respond more effectively to, to to the challenges that are emerging, uh, not only right now, but also in the future. I will stop here, uh, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Teo. Uh, next speaker will be Ambassador Lepour. Ah, 프랑스어로 동력 받으셔서 정말 감사합니다. Thank you. Very much for interpreting in French, and I respect the interpreters in this forum. Pour vous dire que, bien entendu, nous. And in this second session, I would like to touch upon some of the issues that are related to Korean Peninsula. Under the administration of Moon Jae-in, we know the aspiration of Korean people. And I want to mention that North Korean issue is not just an issue for Korean Peninsula because of the concern of the proliferation. This is the issue of the world. And this may show a bad example to other countries.
countries. And this is a bad example of proliferation. And this is also a very important issue to France uh, because if the situation deteriorates, this may bring a huge risk. So in order to support North Korean people, especially females and underaged, we are trying to help them. And I think Korea also needs to pay attention. And what is the priority here? And like Ambassador Eric Teo, I think climate change is also very important. I think we have to raise our target. Paris Agreement should not be enough. We should have a higher target. And the next important thing is transparency. Policies can be effective when it's transparent, and we need to have a specific policies. France had implemented various policies. Regions that are sensitive to climate change and safety, we have built green wall, and we are planning to continue this plan. And the next, it is very sensitive issue, which is DTS, special drawing rights for poorest countries. we have to make sure that they can cope with climate change so that we should help them building the capability. And next, there is Green Climate Fund. I know the headquarter is located in Jeju, and I heard that they have raised some level of money. I have visited Green Fund, and I think we can use this as a very important tool in terms of coping with climate change. It can play a very important role. And uh, next speaker will be Ambassador Catherine Raper. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador No, And uh, I wanted to firstly pick up your reference to the, the Korean War and note that Australia has been a, a very long-standing supporter of peace and stability here on the Korean Peninsula. And that does go back to our contribution of over 17,000 troops to the Korean War, including my own grandfather. Oh. Um, and that continues to be something that we uh, support very strongly, um, both through the uh, enforcement of sanctions, um, but also in supporting engagement and dialogue uh, efforts by the United States and the Republic of, of Korea with the DPRK. So that's an important uh, issue that I uh, just wanted to remark on firstly. Um, secondly, I was also planning to speak on, on the COVID-19 pandemic because there are so many challenges, and we've highlighted so many of them today, but we're not going to be able to get to any of them realistically until we have this pandemic uh, under control. Um, and the key to that is going to be vaccines and having equitable access to vaccines and the cooperation that's going to take between all of us uh, globally, regionally, bilaterally to, to make that happen. Um, we're trying to do our bit in Australia, focusing particularly on our immediate region. Uh, Australia is delivering tens of thousands of uh, vaccines each month uh, to the Pacific and to Timor-Leste to, to help with their uh, countering pandemic uh, efforts. Um, we're also working with our quad partners, India, Japan, the United States, to how we can really pool our efforts, our financing, research, manufacturing and vaccine delivery strengths um, to make a, a real contribution, particularly with our Southeast Asian uh, neighbours. Um, and in fact, next week, Australia, the ROK and ASEAN will be co-hosting a vaccine forum, which will be uh, focused on cooperation for equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines, as well as the post-COVID-19 recovery 
in Southeast, uh, Southeast Asian. Um, and I must also remark too that the G7 Plus uh, Summit uh, also made uh, um, some uh, very uh, uh, welcome uh, announcements on plans to provide vaccines to low and low middle income countries. Um, we're also going to need to focus on the economic recovery from, from COVID-19. Um, we're all, as, as embassies, we're very busy looking at ways that we can find opportunities to contribute to a business-led economic uh, recovery um, and making sure that we take advantage of some of those opportunities that have come about through the pandemic, uh, things like uh, contactless technologies and new modes of, uh, of uh, service delivery have uh, certainly come to the fore during, uh, during COVID-19. Um, we're also going to need uh, um, the rules-based uh, trading system to continue to work, uh, work effectively to underpin all of that. So certainly that will be a big uh, objective of uh, Australia and, uh, and our like-minded countries this year as we approach the ministerial conference at the end of the year. Um, part of that uh, economic response to COVID-19 is going to be a low-carbon future, to touch on the climate change theme that I was just spoken on. Um, Australia's focus is very much on the how we get there and the contribution that low emissions technologies can make to that. We think we're all agreed um, that we, uh, we need to get to net zero emissions, but unless we have the technologies that enable us to, to get there, um, the path forward uh, um, is less clear. So we're very keen to work with partners like Korea and, and others uh, are here um, at the round table on ways that we can uh, get those low emissions technologies to commercial parity with existing energy uh, resources uh, and help to make them commercially viable. So we're actively working in areas such as hydrogen, carbon capture use and storage, battery storage, green steel and aluminium are the particular areas that Australia is focused on in cooperation with the Republic of, of Korea. Um, I might stop there. Uh, of course, I think there are many, many challenges and our, our um, jobs as diplomats are in no danger of going out of business. Um, and it all comes back, I think, to, uh, to cooperation, dialogue and building understanding. So I'm sure I speak for all of us here at the round table that we'll continue to do our, our best to, to further those endeavours. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Catherine Rape. Our last speaker will be Ambassador Ibush from Japan. Thank you. Um, so Japan and the UK had really uh, quite a few common challenges and uh, agendas. Uh, one of the most important uh, issues is uh, uh, the uh, special representative, Mr. Nogido, uh, uh, recently hosted the trilateral meeting. Uh, so the first trilateral meeting after the nomination of the Mr. Sun Kim as special representative. Uh, and uh, uh, my colleague, Mr. Funako, uh, came from Japan. And uh, uh, I, uh, we are glad that this uh, uh, meeting was uh, held uh, in a satisfactory manner. Uh, we need to keep on uh, this uh, momentum uh, from now on. And also, uh, we have some other sort of uh, social issues like uh, uh, aging society, decrease of uh, the working population, or how to prepare for the natural disaster, all these issues. But uh, I'd like to, again, uh, uh, touch upon the climate change. Um, now, Japan and the UK uh, announced this uh, carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, I think in the more than 120 countries already announced its intention to achieve uh, this uh, carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, now the uh, pressing issue is to uh, how to deal with this NDC, uh, nationally determined uh, this contribution. Uh, uh, in case of Japan, we announced or we heightened uh, 46, minus 46 percent uh, by 2030, uh, compared with the 2013. Uh, in Japan, uh, there is some argument that it's not enough, but on the other hand, uh, it's really difficult to achieve all these uh, or still conflicting views uh, on this. And the uh, uh, government of Korea has to announce uh, or the new NDC uh, by COP26 uh, uh, this November. 
And uh, the major sort of uh, so part of the uh, uh, CO2 emission is the uh, power sector. Japan and ROK, uh, two countries, uh, heavily rely on uh, coal power. The uh, Korea has more sort of uh, uh, nuclear power than Japan, around 25, 26%. Six, uh, in case of Japan, we are now increasing uh, renewable energy uh, around 80%. But uh, Japan, uh, Korea, we don't have sort of really uh, enough space uh, for the uh, solar panels or shallow seas, uh, for the oceanic uh, renewable energies and so on. So that uh, uh, it's a really real challenge for Japan, the ROK, to really heighten the, this uh, NDC or achieve our current NDC. So maybe the key is to, to how to deal with innovation. The uh, Japan, uh, likewise uh, Korea, we set up uh, what we call Green Innovation Fund, really huge sum of money, but uh, it may not be enough. So how to, to capture what we call ESG financing, uh, this uh, private uh, money. Uh, they are uh, looking for the uh, investment opportunities in the world. And uh, uh, this is the key. So uh, with our sort of uh, advanced technologies or advanced so innovations, uh, we might be able to, to uh, capture all these financing and then uh, uh, upgrade our sort of NDC. Uh, so that is a challenge we uh, have to face up to. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Aiboshi. Now we are approaching to the end of uh, today's session. After hours of intensive discussion on the topic of diplomacy for sustainable peace and uh, inclusive prosperity. Our discussion today has been very fruitful and stimulating. I would like to thank all the participants for their active participation and contribution during the round table. In my view as a moderator, the discussions about the defined role of diplomacy to promote sustainable peace and inclusive prosperity were timely and fruitful. Let me briefly highlight a few takeaways and share my own thoughts with you. There was a uh, general agreement that the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly brought unprecedented challenges to the practice of diplomacy and dramatically altered its nature. It is also very clear the growing uncertainty is reshaping how countries and diplomats work together. In response, we have come up with innovative changes in the craft of diplomacy, leading to its innovation marked by the rise of digital and hybrid diplomatic process. Simply, diplomacy has to, had to change and adapt. What is clear from our discussion is that the COVID-19 pandemic has made global cooperation and its actors in diplomacy more important than ever. Diplomats and governments have consistently risen to the challenge and adapt their practice so that they can continue promoting peace and prosperity and working together to tackle global challenges. Most speakers today underscored the importance of increasing cooperation expanding the environment of diverse actors in diplomacy. We need to intensify our effort in this complex world. Not a single solution is good enough to meet all the needs. Different countries can play different roles to meet different challenges and needs in the world. Together, we make a difference collectively. As long-term economic prosperity requires political stability, peace can be achieved and will be sustainable in an environment of economic progress and prosperity. History holds lessons for us to learn this virtual cycle 
in which prosperity generates peace, and peace in turn fuels greater prosperity. It is a long cherished, uh, cherished aspiration of the Korean people to stimulate this virtual cycle of peace and prosperity on the Korean Peninsula. And I'm confident it will also contribute to the peace and prosperity across the Asia Pacific region and beyond. At the ROK US summit last month, it was made clear that ultimate goal of complete denuclearization and establishment of permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula will be pursued through diplomacy and dialogue based on previous commitments such as Panmunjom Declaration and Singapore Agreement in 19. Uh, in 2018. At the recently held plenary meeting of the party's central committee, the top leadership of the DPRK stressed the need to get prepared for both dialogue and confrontation in order to protect the dignity of their states and its interest for independent development and to reliably guarantee the peaceful environment and the security of their state. We all know that dialogue and diplomacy is indispensable means to resolve the issue related to the Korean Peninsula. We do not know how soon dialogue with the DPRK will be possible as the pandemic is yet to subside. However, we do know that since your effort by the related parties is a prerequisite in order to resume dialogue. During his recent visit to Vienna, my president, President Moon Jae-in said, if the DPRK agrees to it, we will actively pursue cooperation toward supplying corona vaccines to the DPRK. My government is willing to play a necessary role to facilitate the early resumption of dialogue with the DPRK. With the ultimate goal of complete denuclearization, my government seeks to make progress beyond the irreversible phase of denuclearization through dialogue. By doing so, my government hopes to lay the foundation to continue the progress of the peace process irrelevant to change in administration in Korea. Before closing, anyone to make any, any small remarks for your own closing? Anyone? We have finished all? Okay, friends? Oui, juste simplement pour euh, présenter euh, tous nos voeux et... Euh, euh, I have one last thing to say to people in Jeju, people who had prepared this event. Thank you very much. And I think Jeju is a very wonderful place. And as you are all aware, through this forum, I will going to mark on the map where I can mark the international relations. I really like Jeju. Thank you. 제가 5년 전에 그 마지막으로 제주에 왔는데 그때 I first visited Jeju 5 years ago and I visited Jeju for ASEAN meeting. Yesterday when I visited Jeju I was so surprised because that there were so many people at the airport without mask. It looks like it, it's a normal day. There's, I was so surprised. They were all Koreans. There were no Chinese tourists. There are two embassy in Jeju Island. One is Chinese and the other is Japanese. And I heard both of them are not here anymore. And if you look at the web page, The deep relationship between Japan and Jeju is stated. My colleague 
Mrs. Iseki said that she elaborated a very interesting story on the webpage. So if you have time, please visit the webpage. Speaking in Korean, my mother tongue. <laughs> I'd like to uh, comment, as closing, I'd like to commend the Jeju Forum for their extraordinary support for the meeting and in the preparative process for uh, both substantively and logistically. Also, big thanks to our online audience for tuning in from all over the world. Thank you for your time and attention. And please enjoy your remaining time in the beautiful Jeju Island after this round table. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please give another big round of applause. Thank you very much for your meaningful session and also thank you very much, moderator. And before we officially close, let's wrap up this session with a visual thinking. So let's all have a look. Wow. <laughs> Everything we discussed in this session <laughs> is in this one visual thinking scene. So thank you very much. And uh, we've, we've discussed a lot like this. Wow. <laughs> and the writer didn't miss anything and organizing uh, into visual thinking. So ladies and gentlemen, please give another big round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. And now this brings us to the end of this session. So I would like to thank all of you once again, and I hope you have a meaningful time together. Thank you very much.